Okay, I'm Allison with UKPR, and we're about to get started. Before we do, for all the media calling in, um, if you wouldn't mind, please keep yourself muted during the remarks just because any noise that happens in your area, the feed will bounce back and forth, and then it makes it hard to hear the speakers. Um, if you're using Zoom and you're able to use the chat function, it's much easier to ask your questions. Um, I'm keeping track of it, so I did last time, and then I, I have a mic so I can ask the questions at the end. So if you have any questions as we're going along, I encourage you, you can use the chat function. You can also text me if you're not able to physically type, like if you're using a phone. Uh, my cell phone is 606-782-7735, or you can email me, allison.perry, A-L-L-I-S-O-N dot P-E-R-R-Y at U-K-Y dot E-D-U, and I will keep checking, and then I'll collect your questions as we go along. When everyone's done speaking, um, we'll try to kind of hold here for a second. So if anyone wants to ask a question via Zoom, um, <laughs> turn my phone off, then um, you can unmute yourselves and we'll try to ask your question one at a time so we're not all talking over each other. Okay? Um, also, we can make the video from today available. We'll have that shortly when this is done. We also have B-roll and photos. So if you haven't received that yet, you can contact me. You can contact Christy Willett or Jay and we can get that to you all. Okay, uh, this is very informal. We're gonna go ahead and Dr. Roger Humphreys is gonna go first. He is the Chair of Emergency Medicine at UK. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you to those joining us via Facebook Live and the news media joining on Zoom. As mentioned, I'm Dr. Roger Humphreys. I'm Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine and today we want to provide some information about how we prepared our EDs for an influx of COVID-19 patients and how we continue to be able to meet the needs of any emergency patients in Kentucky. And um, after we hear from our three speakers, we'll open up the floor for questions. First, it's important for me to point out that we have two emergency departments on our campus, UK Good Samaritan and UK Chandler. They have a combined annual census of about 120,000 patients. Both facilities are state-of-the-art uh, with regard to design, staffing, and capacity. The Chandler facility is 40,000 square feet, includes a pediatric ED, a level one adult, and pediatric trauma center. We care for emergency patients also um, with the Comprehensive Stroke Center and the NCI Designated Cancer Center, in addition to other complex patient populations such as cardiovascular patients and transplant patients on our campus. As we prepared for COVID-19, we have uh, two guiding principles in the management of this unprecedented situation. The first is we wanna provide state-of-the-art emergency care to our patients, COVID patients and non-COVID patients. And second, we, we want to do everything we can to protect our staff and our patients from infection. I would like to take a minute uh, just to, to um, thank those um, countless businesses and citizens who have thanked us for being here. Um, we have received so many meals and gestures of appreciation which have uplifted our staff and made their jobs easier uh, knowing that they are so appreciated in the community. I would also like to thank the many businesses and private citizens who have donated so many articles of personal protective equipment, masks, and uh, respirators and other things to make sure that we don't run out, uh, no matter how many patients that we get. And uh, we, we really appreciate this, and this, this brings us a lot of, of um, comfort in how well we are supported. I'm very proud of our dedicated ED team, which is, includes registration clerks, nursing techs, respiratory therapy techs, laboratory technicians, radiology techs, paramedics, nurses, advanced practice providers, and physicians. Over the last three months, the dedication and professionalism that I witnessed in our staff has been truly remarkable. I never heard even one staff member waver in their commitment to caring for our patients, even as they saw healthcare workers in hot spots across the country become ill, and some even succumb to, um, to this crisis. Over the next 30 minutes, you will hear three of our EM physician leaders describe different elements of our COVID response. We will cover some of the innovations in throughput, capacity, and infection control, both in the adult and pediatric populations, 
that we serve. Uh, for background purposes, we will we'll briefly, uh, first we will briefly explain how our regular emergency department patient intake system works. Um, our system has been recognized nationally as an example for other emergency departments to adopt to increase efficiency and patient safety. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Joel Hamm, uh, who has special expertise in global medicine in addition to emergency medicine. He's led our COVID response in the emergency department, so uh, Dr. Hamm. Thanks, Roger. Um, good, good afternoon. As Roger mentioned, I'm an um, emergency medicine physician here at UK. Uh, I've led the uh, response to COVID-19 in the emergency department. Um, we've been very busy over the last couple months. Um, what I wanted to talk about in my section today was our emphasis on patient safety that we've um, implemented. So um, the idea that we started with was to go ahead and split our emergency department into a um, COVID um, potential emergency department and a non-COVID emergency department. So basically we have two emergency departments at this time. So we got a real advantage in Kentucky because we were able to see what um, ERs in Washington State had set up and also uh, New York. Um, so this was a lot of the guidelines and recommendations that we saw um, when we uh, first, start, first started this process. So the, um, our overall goals with this, as was mentioned, was protecting our healthcare workers, um, but also protecting the patients. And those two um, go hand in hand. And also um, minimizing our PPE use. Um, and as you'll see as we talk, the, all of these have been accomplished. Um, so what we did um, when we set up the system was we uh, start with a patient arriving at the door and they're immediately um, screened by a, a nurse in a forward triage type of model. Um, so they're asked questions um, that could potentially put them as uh, infected with COVID-19. Um, if they screen positive at all, they're brought back to the COVID emergency department pod. If they're negative for all the questions, then they actually go to the um, main emergency department. In the main emergency department, there is um, patient, uh, uh, staff still wear PPE, mask, and uh, goggles, but uh, all those patients are uh, complete, completely isolated from potential uh, COVID patients. Um, so this would be patients with um, heart attacks, strokes, any kind of symptoms, um, abdominal pain um, like that will actually go to the main ED and be completely separated from potentially infectious uh, patients. So if the patient does screen positive for um, potentially um, being infectious, they will um, immediately be placed in a mask and brought back to the COVID uh, pod. So in the COVID pod, there's 24 beds each room is um, isolated, um, and um, so they, they have a closed rooms. Uh, all the staff in this unit will actually wear uh, personal protective equipment, and they will change uh, personal protective equipment after each encounter. So that's goggles, face masks, uh, gowns, glo gloves as well. So um, the, the other thing that we're gonna talk about is the implementation of telemedicine. Um, in each of these rooms. So we've uh, placed um, uh, tablets in each of the rooms and we can communicate via telemedicine. This uh, prevents healthcare uh, worker contacts, but also um, uh, protects the patient uh, from having more contacts as well. So that, that is one situation we've set up. Um, the, after the patient's evaluated, um, the uh, patient is discharged and they will, um, the, the room will be extensively cleaned by housecare, housekeeping staff who's also in full personal protective equipment. So the room's protected as well, um, the patient's protected. Um, I think one um, point of emphasis I'd like to just add at the end here is um, recent guidelines from American Heart Association, uh, American Co College of Emergency Physicians are really emphasizing if patients are sick at all um, to go ahead and call 911. If you're having um, chest pain or abdominal pain, um, go ahead and call 911. There's concern that patients are staying home um, that should be evaluated in the emergency department and receive emergent care. And we're, we, we really don't want to prevent a second um, 
public health emergency because patients are staying home when they should be getting um, treatment. Um, so with that, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Daniel Moore. Um, he's um, one of our emergency providers as well. He's gonna talk about uh, the telemedicine, uh, also our screening process, and uh, provide some of the numbers that we're seeing in our emergency department. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ham. My name is Daniel Moore. I'm one of the emergency medicine providers. I've, over the years, been working on a lot of capacity and throughput type projects, um, specifically our patient intake system, our physician intake system in the past that Dr. Humphreys alluded to. Before all this happened, we had far more patients than we had capacity to deal with. And we were um, one of the leaders, if not the leader, in, in the ability to get patients into our system without leaving uh, our left out being seen rate has been 0.2 percent for for years and this month it's zero um, and so we have even before this we've been very intentional about getting patients in to be evaluated by our staff because that is a big patient safety issue but right now our biggest concern as dr ham has alluded to is is that um, our patients are not showing up um, there has been talk in, in the uh, media about staying home, which is absolutely appropriate if you don't feel like you have an emergency condition. But what we have seen is that the pendulum has swung too far in the opposite direction. And um, there was a, an article that was published, and oh, it's, it's pre-published, but the data is out from the Journal of American College of, of Cardiology that shows that um, STEMI, which is really bad heart attacks, activations are down 40% right now in some of the sites that were, that were measured. It's one of the first pieces of objective data that we've seen that emergencies are intentionally not coming into the emergency department. Um, our own data is very predictable month after month after month, year after year with a slight increase. And at, at, as of two days ago when I looked at this, um, our volume, um, 2016, 17, and 18 through the 22nd day in April, we had seen about 5,000 patients predictably year after year. And the same number of acuity, we had seen about 700 critically ill patients during that exact same time year after year, very predictable again. And as of this month, we have seen only 400 critically ill patients. And so what that suggests is that there are people who are sick who are not seeking our care. Um, and we just want to re-emphasize as a group that if you're having abdominal pain, chest pain, stroke-like symptoms, things that you're concerned about, we, we want you to come be evaluated by us and we want to assure you that our processes are safe. Um, specifically, the, the process that Dr. Ham talked about, um, it's happening very quickly on the front. Our nurses are doing a phenomenal job of very quickly segmenting the flow into possible COVID patients and, and patients that don't mean any of the symptoms. And the patients that have possible COVID are, are in the back where they're being taken care of by a group of nurses and doctors that are in an isolated area so that the infection, the possible infection, is not moving from location to location. We're very, um, very much emphasizing the safety of our staff as well. So by having a very sensitive process to where any patient with possible COVID symptoms is identified er as early as possible, then we're able to identify um, the, the, the necessary means to take care of those patients from our staff. And we've had very few um, staff members test positive right now, and our staff safety is of utmost importance to us as well, so that we can take care of our patients. Um, and um, we have very sensitive tests that are available. We have not met the capacity of those tests in our hospital. Um, and uh, we have one of the best labs around, and, and we are screening a lot of people. To date, we've done in the emergency department about 1,800 tests, and about 80 of those have been positive. So the prevalence is still low. While the prevalence is low, we find value in segmenting those patients because we believe that we can, we can identify patients in order to quarantine at home and pr pr produce some public safety, but at the same time keep our patients and our staff safe by, by thinking that, that we are able to keep the disease away from patients that are afraid of getting the disease. So again, we want to emphasize that we are doing everything in our power to try to, to segment these patients so that if you're worried about getting the coronavirus coming to the emergency department, um, that risk is exceedingly low right now because of low prevalence and because of the and because of the processes that we have taken in order to make sure that staff and patients are of, uh, are safe. We, if volume ramps up, if there's ever a surge again, or if there's a second surge in the winter or the fall, we have the expertise and 
also have had significant support from our administrators in order to have overflow space in the emergency department. We are discharging from the emergency department 80 to 90 percent of patients who seek care for coronavirus. Um, they're just not sick enough to necessarily need to be, to be in the hospital. Um, but because of that, the emergency department will be affected first before the rest of the hospital. And we have built a special space for overflow for our coronavirus patients that are being worked up. So we will be able to maintain the separation um, from patients that are being worked up and patients that are not for coronavirus. So we also have the, the expertise with our the last few years of keeping patients out of the waiting room. The, the concern that you're going to come to the waiting room and that you're going to be around patients that have coronavirus if you aren't seeking care for that reason, um, we have the expertise to keep our waiting room clear, which we've done for years with much higher volume. And, and we have processes that have been tried and tested over the last few years, and we will have the capability of doing that if that problem arises again. So to reiterate, patients aren't coming that, that likely have emergent medical conditions. We want, we want you to, to have confidence that we will provide safety for you and for the staff taking care of you, and, and we're here for you um, if you feel like you need our care. And I want to turn over to Dr. Gina Cooper, who is one of our leaders in pediatric emergency medicine, for her to discuss some of the issues regarding our pediatric emergency department. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be able to share with you the work that we're doing in the pediatric emergency department to help protect children and families when they're seeking care for common pediatric problems as well as problems that could be related to coronavirus. Much like the adult emergency department, we also are um, utilizing a split flow model. So that means we have rooms dedicated to patients who have infectious symptoms that could be worrisome for coronavirus or other viruses that can infect others. That allows us to keep those patients and families safe and healthy away from the kids who come into our ED for regular stuff like lacerations and broken arms that need our help anyway. The nurses that help staff those rooms are also separated from nurses taking care of rooms that are not infectious. And that keeps our families and those children safe from interacting with staff that may be having to cross over in a regular season. We're using the same PPE models that our adult providers are using so that our nurses are in full protective gear helping to keep their own bodies and, and families healthy at home, but also keeping our patients and families safe. That model has been working really well for us in the pediatric ED, helping us to see children who need to be cared for and also keeping other families um, safe when they come to the ED. From the triage perspective, kids are coming directly back into rooms the same way that we're seeing on the adult side. So they're not waiting in the, in the typical waiting room where they could interact with each other and potentially um, spread some germs like we know kids tend to do. That, I think, has been a really helpful change in the model to make sure that we're not increasing community spread. Additionally, um, as kids are getting outside at the end of their non-traditional instruction days in their own yards trying to burn off some energy, we know that they're going to do the regular things that children do. They're going to break their arms. They're going to get a cut that needs stitches. And we want you to know that we're still here to help you take care of those regular life emergencies. We have our PEDS dedicated nursing staff. We have our child life specialists. And we have a way to help keep your family safe when you come visit us to be sure we can take care of those regular problems. Problems. In terms of children being infected by coronavirus, we've been really fortunate in that most children have very mild symptoms and aren't demonstrating the same life-threatening illness symptoms that we see in our adult populations. That being said, from the testing we've done here at UK, we've really only had one positive child in, in an age group under 10 for coronavirus. So within our pediatric population, though there is certainly community prevalence, we're not seeing the same degree of prevalence and the same degree of need for critical care as we might be seeing in some of our older adult populations. All in all, we're here 24-7 to help your children and your family stay safe and also get testing that you need. I think now it's time for questions, so I will step to the side. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, Allison from Off Screen, and I know we had some issues with the Zoom feed. I think people could hear, but the video kept freezing. Um, we kind of directed people to watch it on Facebook Live, which was working. I know Facebook Live has like a 20 to 30 second delay. Um, so again, if you have questions, if you're a reporter watching, you can use the Zoom chat function to send them to me. You can text them to me. You can email them to me. 
but we'll just kind of wait here for a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions to ask. I'd also like to mention that today we have Dr. Patty Howard, who's the Director of Emergency Services here, if there are any questions uh, for her as well. Thank you. Okay, question coming in. Can you give us a hard average number on daily arrivals at the emergency department before the pandemic compared to today? So I can tell you, um, over the last year, we probably saw somewhere around 250 total patients a day. In the beginning of March, we, we were seeing around 300 patients per day. Um, the last few weeks, we've been seeing around 130 patients per day in the Channel Emergency Department. Um, we're seeing similar things at our Good Samaritan Emergency Department in terms of, of the total, total volume decrease. And that is actually um, about what most EDs nationally are seeing, about a 50% decrease in total volume. Pediatric emergency departments are seeing about a 77% decrease in total volume. Um, so this is not, you know, this is not uh, unique to our department. Some of the hot spots have obviously seen some increase, but overall emergency department volume is low nationally. Okay, we'll wait a couple more seconds. If anyone else has any questions, wants to send them to me. Um, I also want to reiterate for our media friends watching that we will have high quality video of the remarks that we'll make available to you. We also have B-roll and photos that we will send to you if you haven't already received that. Are the beds needed at Nutter Fieldhouse? So at this point, um, the number of, of COVID patients in the hospital here uh, is, is, is low. If we get a surge of patients, um, then that, that could be a possibility. But um, based on what's happening right now in Kentucky, uh, the answer is probably going to be no. Okay, again, we'll wait a minute or two, see if anyone else has any questions, because I know there's a little bit of a delay and it kind of takes you a minute to type them out. I think I'm asking this one correctly. If there are 24 beds for COVID, in the COVID section of the emergency department, how many are filled today? About half of the beds in that 24 bed unit are filled right now with patients that are being evaluated. Any other questions, feel free to text me, email me, put them in the Zoom chat. What is your medical opinion on Governor Brashear's handling of COVID-19? Has his approach limited the number of cases in your opinion? Yes, the social distancing um, guidelines that have been followed here in Kentucky have, have been best practice. And um, I'm sure that we have seen a lot less patients than we would have seen had we, had we not heeded those, the advice of the governor. All 
right, again, we'll wait about another minute to see if anyone else has any questions. Um, and just as a reminder, if you have any questions after the fact, you can contact me or Christy Willett with your questions. We will try to get them answered. Okay, again, your advice to those who have emergencies, how do you convince them that the hospital is safe? So, you know, some of the, I think the arguments we've been making the last few minutes are our attempt to, to show that the safety of, of our patients and providers are our utmost concern. Um, you know, we are, every single person that is even in this room right now, we took our masks off just because we're speaking, but every person in this institution is being screened before they walk into the door. We have masks on everyone. We, are, we have a very intense cleaning um, um, processes that are going through our, our, our um, staff that are cleaning our rooms are doing a phenomenal job on, on that. Um, you know, we are making sure that patients that have aerosolization, so if you're coughing, if you have certain procedures going on, if that is going on, we're putting you in negative pressure rooms. There are lots of negative pressure spaces in the institution that have been converted into negative pressure space. Our, our overflow area has been put into negative pressure space. We're using telemedicine to decrease um, interactions with providers and and staff so that infection doesn't go into one area and, and out, out into another area. Um, and, um, and we're also, we have an incredibly sensitive screening process on the front end. When you walk through the door, our nurses ask you a list of questions based on, on evidence on whether or not you possibly could have coronavirus. You know, to reiterate the point of the, the COVID pod, the COVID area, um, of the patients that have put, been put into that pod that have had tests since, we only have a 4% prevalence of a positive test. So even patients that are put into that area, it's an incredibly sensitive process to make sure that the patients that possibly have that disease are placed into that area. We are making sure that the patients that possibly don't are not interacting in any way with those patients physically at all. Our waiting room is clear. It's been clear for years. Um, and so the likelihood that you're going to interact as a susceptible individual in our emergency department at right now is probably less likely than you interacting in the public with a patient um, that has coronavirus. Um, and I can say that pretty confidently right at the moment. Okay, I think we kind of planned on 30 minutes for this, so we'll wait maybe 30 seconds or so if anyone else has any questions. Um, Otherwise, again, if you're a reporter watching, you can always reach out to me or Christy if you have any questions after the fact. We will make um, the video from this available, plus uh, multimedia and B-roll. Okay, I think we are good, so thank you all for coming. Again, reach out to me or Christy if you have any questions, uh, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.